One of the probably important things in this industry is that, you know, us as manufacturers, we can't lose sight of what occurs downstream, right? We don't have that clear visibility. We sell that product to a distributor. That distributor then sells that to the dealer. The distributor doesn't then see the visibility of where that product is at the consumer level. And I think from a manufacturer perspective, we really need to stay close through every single of the stages downstream so that way we can make better products. We can support our dealers more. We can understand their pain points and learn how to support better. This is episode 155 with Brad Parker and Donnie Sislo of Fluidra. Enjoy! Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Diafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time to be here with us all the way from beautiful San Diego. Thanks for having us. You know, it's great to be here. And, uh, you know, you guys are well-respected in the in the industry. Love listening to your guys' podcasts. So can you introduce yourselves to the listeners? I'm Donnie Sislo, uh, Director of Sales Ops and Trade Marketing uh, for North America. Uh, I report up through the sales side of the business. Primarily, uh, my team focuses on three things. Uh, one is the uh, sales uh, efficiency of our uh, field sales team, You know, making sure that they have the tools, technology to make them effective in the field and, and support our customer base. The second area is uh, programs and promotions and dealer enablement tools to really kind of support our dealers to help them be able to sell our products uh, more efficiently. And then the third piece is uh, you know, data. Data, we're uh, trying to understand uh, how our sales and our performance and benchmark the, the sales organization and, and the performance in the marketplace. Very nice. And how did you get to doing what you do today? Yeah, you know, it's been a, uh, you know, a long road of, uh, you know, primarily being in a sales position uh, for the number of years. But, you know, I, I, I grew up outside of Chicago and uh, you know, strong work ethic in my in my family. I started working at a young age. My father had a manufacturing plant that I, uh, you know, producing two way radio antennas and uh, spent a, a lot of time learning the ins and outs of that. Eventually evolved and wanted to learn a little bit, else, a little bit about sales. So I ended up selling knives door to door, Cutco, right? And so, <laughs> you know, you got like, you, you know, today, like if you get a, that, that person knocking on your door trying to sell solar panels and stuff, like that was me, but I had a bag of knives and saying, hey, you know, invite me in and let me show you how the, these cut, right? So, uh, you know, I did, I did that. Sure, that's so trusting, yes. Yeah, so, so trusting, trusting yes. Uh, you like to come in and kill me? <laughs> yeah, so all the stay-at-home moms, you know, invited me in with this bag of knives and I did well. I, I, I did really well selling knives. Uh, but, you know, after uh, college, kind of more of a professional, uh, you know, uh, uh, scene, I wanted to really get that big business experience. So I worked for uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, a $25 billion company. Company. You know, that was a great, you know, they got a great uh, corporate structure and uh, they give you the tools to run your own business. And uh, that is a stepbrothers quote from Will Ferrell, but uh, it actually is like they are, <laughs> they are a great training program. But from there, I want to get my MBA. The schedule didn't really work out uh, uh, at Enterprise, but I also want to get more B2B experience. So I worked for uh, Staples, a $15 billion company and worked on their contract and commercial side of the business. Uh, from there, I wanted to learn big uh, contract sales and uh, worked for uh, Kimball International. Um, you know, we do seven digit, uh, seven digit sales uh, on contracts, one PO, one location. And it was really there kind of learning about how to partner with the, uh, our dealers. You know, as a manufacturer, as a dealer, we worked very, very closely from, you know, even staffing, interviewing, uh, cultivating, prospecting, doing the RFPs, closing the deals and servicing them. We were tied at the hip. And from there, I wanted to get into a different type of industry where I can work at a headquartered location. And I uh, had a few companies in mind that were nearby. And, you know, at the time it was Zodiac and now Floridra and uh, really got inspired by a handful of things. I remember walking in the very first day and seeing the big wall of patents and I'm like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. And then, you know, start learning about the different channels of the builder, the service, the retail, and all of them have these unique you know, needs and, you know, really love that challenge of understanding how do you partner with them. And, and I really love the resilience of the industry, right? The build and the aftermarket side of things, and really, really, uh, just found that really fascinating. And, and the breadth of product, right, from 
I draw the automation and, and just, just felt like there was just a lot there for me to really grasp onto and really glad about the choice that I made uh, to, to be with Floridra. Nice. Thank you, Donnie. I mean, it sounds like you've had a pretty successful career so far. So what do you like to do for fun? We know, you know, Brad over here, he's usually, you know, hitting the waves or, uh, you know, (laughs) building a chicken coop or something. (laughs) What was it? Chicken coop. Chickens died, though. Oh, they died? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Didn't survive the pandemic. They didn't survive the pandemic. Damn. Damn. I thought they the chickens know. would have been the ones to make uh, it. It, it, it was want... a coyote, but. Uh, <laughs> Dude, we have a coyote problem here yeah. right now, too. I mean, we're in the desert. You got a coyote problem in San Diego? Yeah, in, in uh, Southern California, any communities that back up to any sort of open space, uh, the coyotes seem to come out looking for cats, small pets, apparently chickens. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. that sucks. Yeah, so Man. still got a coop though. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta find something to put, to put in there. That's right. That's where the kids go when they misbehave. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> be a good hiding spot for uh, Easter eggs or something. I don't know. It's like, come on, Dad, be more clever than that. Um, so, what do you like to do for fun, Don? Yeah, well, actually, uh, you know, Brad and I have kind of some similar background. The way we you know, we both uh, worked in uh, on a commercial fishing boat, you know, at, at one point in our in our lives, and so uh, you know, I love fishing just in general. Uh, fly fishing specifically um you know as many years there i was tying my own flies and uh go up to uh go somewhere at least once a year to uh go fishing uh you know northern idaho absolutely love it up there uh but fishing biking i used to play a lot of basketball you know now just kind of the the injuries and everything is kind of preventing me from doing that but uh road biking has been really big lately since the uh the pandemic you know uh, just getting out on the road every weekend and riding so uh uh, anything outdoors, I absolutely love gardening as well. I, I do a lot of gardening. Any single, you know, in, in Southern California, you don't got a lot of space, but I try to, any single pot I can find, I'm growing something out of it. <laughs> That's super cool. And we're going to get into, you know, a bunch of business stuff here soon, but I'd like to hear about these things. What kind of uh, bike do you ride? Yeah, I have a specialized mountain bike right now. So I used to always go, uh, a mountain bike or it's, and a road bike? It's a mountain bike that I used to always go mountain biking, but then since the pandemic, I started to go far, further and further. So I'm mountain biking on the road. And I've actually been, you know, we'll talk about it later in regards to uh, just the pandemic, what's done with supply and everything else, but it's impacting all these different industries. I've had a deposit on a road bike that's been on there for like half a year already. And some people are saying it might be a, a year until I get a bike. So I've got this uh, mountain bike that I've been patching up with all these different parts and stuff. And get this, my bike had broken down, took it in for a, a part repair and said, oh, the part won't be available for, you know, I don't know, about another year or so. So I was looking on the internet, bought a part from the UK, had it shipped in to me to be able to bring it to my bike shop to get it fixed. And it's just it, it's it's unbelievable what how uh, bad the do you want it? How, how bad do you yeah, want to ride I, that I, bike? I, I wanted it pretty <laughs> bad, <laughs> right? Oh, that's so cool. So, what's new with you, Brad? What have you been? What have you been up to? Uh, what have I been up to? Still surfing. That's kind of if I have a couple hours on a Friday afternoon, Saturday, Sunday morning. That's that's my priority. I get out there and do that. A lot of kids sports. So, daughter's busy with volleyball. Son's busy with basketball. So. It's a it's a good bad thing, right? Like I enjoy watching them, but it's also tough when four hours of a Saturday or Sunday gets eaten up with driving around San Diego County. Like Donnie, uh, I've always loved to putz around the backyard, build trellises and string lights, and kind of create a cool outdoor experience, uh, plants, hedges, and all that. So I'd say that's pretty much been put on steroids over the last you know nine to twelve months. Um, so which is cool because my yard was pretty vacant, lots of open space. Now it's starting to fill in. So <laughs> I, I did getting back there and just kind of doing some labor and fixing it up and having fun with it. Yeah, that's really cool. And I've heard from, you know, other executives and different things like that, that they all like to do yard work and things like that, or fix cars because it's a great getaway. You know, you're in all these um, you know, high level situations where you're having to think all the time, you're looking at a computer, you're looking at spreadsheets, you're doing all these things that there's something about putting your hands in the dirt or making something grow, or even just mowing the grass, pulling weeds. Like it's such a great getaway. Is that kind of what it is for you guys? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, th- I think, uh, 
you know, we're hard workers, you know, got a strong hard work ethic. And, you know, I think over the years you, you learn how to, you know, change the way in which you work. You know, I think the, you know, com- from a commercial fishing standpoint, both Brad and I, I mean, you, you work long hours, you're working with your hands, you're, 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 you're doing a lot of that. And, you know, we still crave that. Right. And so, you know, being able to work with your hands in a car or in the backyard, or anything else kind of bring some of those elements. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to say it's a, a it's a distraction from work where you, you separate yourself. But quite frankly, I find myself getting really creative with even thinking about work while I'm doing those types of things. And so uh, I, I find it really relaxing and, and uh, therapeutic, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah. I go into a, you know, say you're set in posts and have to dig, you know, several 18 inch diameter by two foot holes or something like that. It's just, you know, it's not fun work, but there's something gratifying in it. You kind of just go into Zen mode and yeah, sort of let things process in their own time. And before you know it, you're sweaty and dirty and you got three or four holes dug. So it's, yeah. there, there is something kind of just good. You turn off the brain and let things go and dig in. That's awesome. So, you know, last time uh, on episode 31, we discussed how Jandy was quitting the internet and, you know, you were the first of the manufacturers to roll out that program. You know, how has the response been since then? Yeah, about a little over two years ago now, we launched that move to quit the internet with our GND line of whole good equipment. Response was very positive, very enthusiastic, as you could imagine. I think everyone immediately understood the logic of us, why we're doing that. And it was very clear that by us doing that and taking that stance, how it benefits pool pros, particularly in service and retail. But yeah, I mean, to this day, um, we haven't let up. There's literally 24 seven enforcement. We have a team of six people that meet weekly to look at current violations against the policy. And then we work with those violating to rectify the violation. So right now we're, we're seeing, uh, above 90% compliance with the policy. So there's always people that you know, it could be a mistake. It could be some automatic feed that went wrong and something went online with the price. But uh, our team's really good, you know, of the, the folks that consistently are in violation. We, you know, we deal with them in a more stern manner. For those that make a mistake, we kind of put the focus on educating them to make sure they, you know, don't violate. But it's been a big move for us and, you know, really successful move. And I think really kind of put a lot of sort of a, uh, gravity behind the the jandy brand you know that we really kind of do that brand is for the pool pro and and i think it added a lot of meaning to what that brand stands for in this industry right um for those that don't know can you explain kind of what is a violation you know kind of what you can and can't do in terms of online sales because we like to think that our listeners do a handful of things where they're selling things online or the impulse service or whatever it may be, because you can still buy some things online, right? Sure. You can, well, you can, uh, um, in terms of Jandy whole goods and products like a, a pump, a heater, a filter cannot be sold online. They can be shown online. They can be advertised in line with online without a, a price, but they cannot be transacted online. So for example, a local retailer can uh, on their, you know, have a product page that advertises the JND JXI heater. What, and they can even have a call that's a, a call to action that says call for information on pricing or, or you know, for pickup, for in store pickup. Um, they just can't have an add to cart and a, a function that allows them to transact online. So there are still a select range of uh, parts and accessories within the JND uh, family um, that are available online, but for whole goods, uh, that that it um, can only be kind of shown and advertised online, not not sold or transacted. Okay. So what is considered not a whole goods? So not a whole good. An example would be like a particular collar or accessory that would oh, go okay. on a pump, okay. a pump lid, something like that. Uh, we typically call them our kits. But like O-rings or something. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Simple sort of bits and pieces that kind of make out the entire whole good count as a, a part or accessory. Right. So since uh, that time you've merged with Fluidra, how has that, you know, transition been? How long has it been now? It's been a little over two years since we completed the the merger. It's been good. You know, on a functional level, one of the benefits has been you get these two 
leading companies in Zodiac and Fluidra. They each have their own market expertise. They each have their own history. They each have learned a lot along the way, right? We've all had missteps and learnings and um, you take kind of all that background information, you pull the two companies together, and all of a sudden you have a bunch of engineers coming from different perspectives that can talk about what works, what doesn't work, what they're seeing in the marketplace, where they think technology is going, how they can improve the pool experience for the consumer and the pro. And the same thing holds for, you know, operations teams, right? So our operations and logistics basically got doubled you know, touched more parts of the globe, which allows us exhaust different lines for sourcing products, materials for our supply chain. All in all, you kind of immediately add a lot of expertise to uh, the company as a whole. So that aspect of integration has been really good. And I think, you know, here in North America, you've seen us make moves like the acquisition of CMP recently, which, you know, is a signal of us kind of really investing in the business, the industry, trying to broaden our product line and our offering for our pool pro. When something like that happens, does everybody do all the teams now? Are you all under one roof, like at the San Diego location? Like is everybody now at Fluidra or are there still separate offices? It's a mix of both. You know, in some places you consolidate office space where it makes sense. But, you know, in the case of CMP, there's still a, a Noonan office in Georgia with our CMP colleagues. So we're all part of the kind of the Fluidra family. But, you know, there may be different focuses in terms of uh, what you do day to day for business and what you focus on versus what we focus on in Carlsbad. So it's always kind of a case by case basis. But just because you acquire doesn't mean you automatically kind of move everyone out to San Diego. Right. Bummer for them. <laughs> Seriously. Just kidding. We, look, I know a lot of the CMP guys. They're, they're awesome. But... Uh, Georgia's cool. Atlanta's cool. <laughs> Georgia, Georgia's, Georgia's not San Diego, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's what's interesting about it is that, we, you know, we, 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 these companies have grown in the CMP example, and they've created a very successful business. And, you know, you, the last thing you want to do is disrupt that, right? You, you want to learn. You want to adapt and uh, understand what, what makes them tick and how can we improve. And I think, you know, just going to the whole Floridra merger and stuff, and Brett hit it right on, you know, it's resources, it's mind share, it's different perspective. It's just how can we fill in the different gaps? How can we support that dealer by filling in these gaps? And I think it goes to a lot of the values from a customer collaboration, uh, excellence and in innovation, and our passion for success, which ultimately is, you know, how, how can we make our, our, our dealers win in the marketplace? When they do, we win too. And so as we grow, we have this wealth of products and it allows us to think more you know, long-term future thinking is is really kind of what these two two companies uh, bring together. Yeah, the interesting thing with mergers or acquisitions is you're bringing together people that come from different space, right? They have different perspective. They come from different markets, different company cultures. So I'd say one thing that was really important that we did during the Fluida merger is uh, we kind of completely uh, deconstructed existing sort of values. Um, that each company had and then worked together as the two companies to recreate kind of new values. So a lot of people don't give that sort of stuff much credence, you know, because it's sort of uh, the, the soft aspect of a culture of a company. But what's important is that both companies, the people within those companies worked on defining like, okay, well now, you know, we're no longer the old Fluidra, we're no longer the old Zodiac. Let's just accept that that's the case, right? So going forward, who are we going to be as a company? What are we going to stand for? And what are we going to prioritize? Obviously, business is there. Product roads are there. Product development is there. But really, this is about when you get beyond that, like what kind of stamp do you want to put on the marketplace, on the industry? What do you want to mean to customers when they hear the word fluid? Or so you get to this point where we spend a lot of time talking about values, you know, and you have values that touch all part of the company from um, passion for results, innovation and excellence, but also a lot of emphasis on customer collaboration. Like to Donnie's point, we don't win if our customers don't win, right? We need to be listening. We need to be easy to do business with, and we need to support their growth and also teamwork, right? Which is a bit more internal focus to the company, but same value applies externally as we're kind of looking to join hands with customers versus just build a product and ship from point A to point B and then call the relationship done. It's not how it works. Right. How connected are say you guys to maybe the the actual 
like engineers and people that are developing new products, you know, like grasping, you know, new concepts and innovations and how you might market those things or sell those things. And now that you're merging with a, a lot of different company, you now have, there's a lot more options in the swimming pool space. So what, are the, what does that relationship look like with your team? So Donnie and I work in different parts of the company. We work very closely, but like he said, he comes from the sales side. For me, I'm from the marketing side. So to answer your question kind of from the marketing side, I'd say day in, day out, we're working with our product managers who kind of manage different product categories. My counterpart is the VP of engineering, who I work with regularly, have uh, biweekly meetings with. So lots of day-to-day -day interaction, but, you know, I'd say for me, obviously the pandemic's kind of screwed stuff up. Typically I would get out in the field and actually talk with customers, do some customer visits and stay close to them. But, uh, you know, one key thing where, where I do get closely involved is when we run research projects, whether that's kind of concept testing a product idea or just kind of general market research where you're trying to understand, you know, what do consumers want? Or what do pool professionals need, right? Doing your user work. So, and it could be stuff as simple as where you put the handle on a pump or where you put the handle on a lid or, you know, <laughs> what types of screws you're using to make sure that a pro just needs one kind of uh, Allen wrench in their pocket and don't need to have a full set of six different things that they're constantly fishing for. So, you know, to me, that's a real kind of critical avenue into what matters out there in the real world. Yeah, I love that. I think we all know that it's function and how long it's going to last and it's warranty. That's a given how important that is. But it's those little things, you know, if you're talking with your customers, which would be say us if we're pool service guys or builders and we're telling you that, man, like why is your handle like this or, you know, why is this not bolted here or this would make my life easier if these buttons were here, whatever it may be and you're bringing that, you know, back to the engineering team and making those adjustments like that stuff i think is just as important as the function you know the actual the technical mm. function of say the pump or the filter or anything like yeah. that so that's really cool what um, about from your side from the sales side yeah i mean i, th I think uh, i think when you look at from a, a manufacturing standpoint and and from a, the sales perspective is and you're, you're kind of hitting on it right there is that the people that we learn from the user work are, are the people that are day-to-day -day working with the the consumers and also installing it prescribing it and they're the ones that know best right you know they're they're the ones that are going to be uh giving giving the feedback to us and so we lean very heavily upon our, our field sales folks because they're with our, our our customers our dealers day to day and and they have a lot a lot of great insight uh, they're very knowledgeable about our products and they are involved in introducing new products yeah i think you guys have really amazing sales teams i mean that's always been really impressive with with your guys side of things i think everybody that i've always talked to that uses your products on a regular basis that's the they feel like you guys really take care of them in that way. And I think that's, yeah. that's an aspect that's missing elsewhere sometimes. So really good job on that. Do you ever find yourself at a pool party or anything that's like pool related where you might start asking these questions? I bet people hate me when I go to different parties and stuff. Cause I'm just <laughs> like, so, you know, what do you like about, you know, your pool? How do you like this deck? Does it get hot? Is it cool? <laughs> like, why did you pick this pool service? Like, I can't help it. You know what I mean? This weekend I was at a pool party for my, I was having uh, beers with a bunch of the parents and I was talking to the owner of the house and the kids were swimming. And, uh, you know, I went back and looked at his, his equipment, equipment. set to see what he had, <laughs> yep. of course. And then, uh, you know, I start asking him, uh, so how do you heat your pool? You got solar? Cause I couldn't see any solar mm. netting anywhere, but, but what was cool is he's an engineer. Mm. So he was totally willing to nerd out on like <laughs> how he had things programmed and set up and you know, his pool care. So, um, but yeah, sometimes you kind of get those like, like, I don't know. I just, some guy comes once a week and I swim. It's perfect. But it was, it was That's funny. Hilarious. You can't help but go there. I could just see somebody <laughs> like looking at your LinkedIn. I'm like, oh shit, clean the pool. <laughs> get everything nice and neat. Pick up all the trash by the equipment. Make sure it's nice and neat. He's probably going to ask why we're using this. Oh, that's hilarious. Very good. We're going to take a quick break. But when we get back, we discuss the many layers of being a manufacturer, the amount of steps that have to be taken to make even a slight product change, and the distinction between manufacturer, distributor, and dealer. This episode of the Pool Chasers podcast is brought to you by Leslie's. 
As a pool service professional, it's important to have the right partners. Leslie's values the important work you do to serve your local communities, and they want to help. With the new Leslie's Pro Partner Program, you can take advantage of the benefits only Leslie's has to offer. As a member of the program, you will get customer referrals and wholesale pricing. Additionally, you can take advantage of Leslie's extended hours during the week and on the weekends. When we were running Brothers Pool Service, we often used Leslie's when we needed supplies, especially on the weekends, and since they have over 900 locations, they were convenient to get to. They also offer free in-store services like water testing and cleaning repair. To learn more, check out episode 151 of the podcast, or stop by your local Leslie's store today to sign up for the program. This episode of the Pool Chasers podcast is also brought to you by Primate Pool Tools. All right, by now you've heard us talk about our friends at Primate Pool Tools, right? All their poles are made with aerospace-grade carbon fiber, which offers 10 times the strength of aluminum at half the weight. This allows you to cut through the water with ease. They have options for any level of commercial and residential maintenance with multiple models of poles to choose from, as well as an extension system that can extend the reach of any pole up to 40 feet. Primate Pool Tools continues to lead the way in carbon fiber technology by now offering stainless steel version of their flagship 2X and 3X models that are ideal for heavy vacs, as well as custom limited edition designs and brand new custom grips. All the Primate Poles are handmade in the USA, come with a one-year commercial warranty, and most importantly, top-notch customer service. Right now, you can get $20 off your order by using Pool Chasers 2021. That's Pool Chasers 2021 at checkout. And make sure to listen to episode 104 or click the link below for more information. You know, without getting too deep, what exactly goes into being a manufacturer and why is the role essential to the overall process. I mean, manufacturer, that is like, that is everything. Without the manufacturers, we have nothing. We would just be out here taking care of whatever we have until the end of time. But you know, what, what really goes into this? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's actually probably a good segue into what we were talking about before. It's uh, building the right product, right? You know, understanding what what is it that we should build and what, what is the gap, what is the need? Uh, and then it's building the product right, right? You, you need it to be able to facilitate its use, right? And then you need a, uh, a service plan for the life cycle of that product. But, you know, all that starts with research, research, research. And it comes to talking to our dealers, understanding their needs, how to install, prescribe it, et cetera. But, uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot to that process and it's, you got to create prototypes. You got, you got to source the product. You, you got to get the raw materials. I mean, there's some products that we have where you have to get a raw material from a specific mine in Europe because you have to abide by certain compliance and legalities and all these other things. And there's continuous, you know, testing and stuff. And I encourage your listeners to come to a Carlsbad lab and take a look at our lab and just how much testing goes into our products. And, you know, there's the, there's the marketing side. There's just a lot that goes into it. But ultimately, the reason why we do all this is to, to make sure that we can produce a product that dealers can put their name behind. They, they need to trust that, hey, this product, and I'm going to put my name behind and put it in that, it's going to do what it's intended to do, right? It's my company's name and my livelihood on the line for it. But I mean, I, the way I really kind of like to frame it up is um, we are uh, supporting our dealer's vision of what the industry could be, right? And, and what I mean by that is we think about how we start, you know, the product development phase. It's hearing what they need hearing their pain points. You know, I wish the handle was here. I wish the button was, I wish this piece was able to do X, Y, and Z. And if you look at the industry over the past five years, the average equipment pad has increased over 30%. You know, outside of price increase, I mean, you look at variable speed pumps, automation, salt, LED lights, right? We're taking uh, feedback from our dealers and, and creating essentially this vision and capability of what our, our dealers uh, envision it to be. Yeah, love that. And we, uh, I'm not sure how long it's been, but when we came to the San Diego location, you'd only probably been there, what, some months or yeah. even a year. And we were just blown away. I mean, the facility was huge. And I can't even imagine where it's at today. That is for anybody in that area, if you are taking people to kind of give them a tour. That place is about, truly up to about three weeks ago. It was a ghost town. So no, one was, no one was in there. No, yeah. but, uh, no barbecues. Yeah. No, no nothing. No, well, just with uh, with everything going on in California. But we're we're right. back in the office now, and uh, you know, seriously, your listeners should come through. Uh, it's a great facility, and uh, we we'd, we'd love to have them. Yeah, and I think one thing that's 
cool that people probably don't get is uh you think all the product development ideation concepting you know fabrication all happens kind of pre-product launch the reality is once you launch a product that product's never fully done right so we have a very robust quality process right so feedback can come into us we're listening on social channels we're reading product reviews and and ratings that come in through our websites we have uh, our field team, like Donnie said, one of our most important touch points with the customer and pool owner, they have the ability to give us a, a feedback via communications channel. And we have a quality team that reviews that every week. And what they're doing is they're taking all these different inputs and identifying where are consistent themes coming up, right? Because sometimes there's just user error or there may be uh, isolated product issues, but other times there's themes coming up that, you know, need improvement and they could be, you know, go from a product failure on through kind of, uh, kind of inputs that suggest ways you can optimize a product experience. So, you know, once that product gets out there, it's not necessarily not being further developed. And, and that's kind of a continual life cycle process that I think school is a company, you know, that we put a lot of focus on. Cause it's, it's critical. Like, like Tony said, like, you know, this is not fluider's names, you know, our brands are on the product, Jandy Polaris, nature Two, Iaqualink, et cetera. But really the relationship with the pool owner is with that, you know, service company that's replacing equipment or the, um, pool builder that's putting in the pool. So, you know, we take seriously that the, the table stakes of this industry is your product better be reliable, better be good. So that the focus is on the amazing experience and not headaches with trying to get the heater to fire and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I know every product that you manufacture is different, but let's say a pump, for instance, what does that process look like when you are going to make that product better? Because I'm sure you're looking at warranty, what warranty claims have been made and how can we make those adjustments to how we're going to make it better. We're looking at maybe a Facebook groups and social media and all these different things. But if you're taking an existing variable speed pump and we need to make this better, does it, you know, I'm thinking of like a, a comma online where it's going back to the beginning and that's where it's going to go back through this process. Like I'm just making these assumptions. Like yeah. what does that look like going through? Cause it's pretty much at the end. This was the variable speed pump, say for instance, but now you want to make it better and it goes back. Like, let's just give the listeners a sense of how crazy this can actually be. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, the good part about, uh, you know, Floridra is we have a lot of smart people on board and uh, a lot of smart, smarter people than probably Brad and I that specialize in this type of an area. When you're talking about a, a brand new product versus, uh, making, uh, an adaptation to an existing product, there's a lot of components that uh, come into play. So you look at all the different data points, you look at technology that you have, you look at what, what it is that you're trying to fix. Are you value engineering? Are you putting in a, a new piece of an innovation? Is it, is it technology driven or is it an aesthetics or is it functionality? And each one of those has a, a, a different type of a product roadmap that goes through feasibility and testing and prototyping. And it, I would say it really kind of depends on what that product is and there's a lot to it, right? Because uh, how much do you improve a legacy product if you may have something new that's in development and already on the launch schedule? So you look at kind of whatever you may be learning about a legacy product, putting that into the new product um, instead, you know, so you build that one out and better than ever. So a lot of it is kind of there's just logistical issues with, with timing. And also, you know, you always do an assessment on what value you get out of the effort you put into something legacy versus new. Cause there is always that in the total product life cycle, there's always going to be that point at which you decide to move off a uh, older introductory technology and shift focus to what's going to be kind of new and even better with 10 X, the potential of what the old item had. So I know that's kind of a general way to answer the question, but there's, there's so much to kind of, that's what I wanted, you know, yeah. is just for people to understand that there's so much to it. Cause I think when you're not a manufacturer, you don't understand what goes into that where I'm like, why can't you just put that little thing on there where you might not understand that that is millions of dollars to do that, where you're 
Uh, even just the uh, new branding, new packaging that might have to go to onto a box. Um, there's all these little things that you might not know of. There's creative time in maybe illustrations or a video and website stuff. Like it's not just easy little fix yeah. where we just turn the dial. I think a lot of maybe like, you know, internet tech companies can maybe do that. But when it comes to like manufacturing yeah. of physical goods. Yeah. I think to kind of put some like color around this one too. I mean, even when we did our Jandy trade series exclusive, like change, like put a little yellow sticker on a box and it was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> the amount of like, you know, stages you have to go through and, you know, go to the manufacturer, make sure it's being displayed and, you know, in the correct ways and, you know, update all the drawings, et cetera. And then, you know, you just really look at kind of what's going on, you know, currently right now in the industry and this heightened demand that, you know, when you have a product, you got, you know, MOQs of the, uh, of the raw material, you got to get those raw material to a certain location. You got to make sure that uh, you have the people to be able to build these products. You have to make sure you have the machinery in place. And some of these machines are like a million dollars just to put in a machine and start pumping, you know, product out. And so it, you know, just to be able to see the way that even we've performed this past year, what we've done, it, it's a huge testament to our supply chain and uh, our ability and our operations team to be able to just produce because you have to think of forecasting of of this product as well and that's all part of the the manufacturing process too yeah, every everything's so process driven you know as you work back from from where donnie and i sit in carlsbad back through our manufacturing facilities when you get to that manufacturing facility level you know they're they're not just doing one pump typically they're doing several product lines and there's just very clear processes about who does what on that line and what goes in. So if we want to kind of add a sticker or change a sticker, you know, the first thing you deal with, like, well, we have an inventory of 30,000 of these stickers. Do we trash them? It's going to cost you this versus immediate, you know, do a running change. And so anytime you know, like th there, there are no ad hoc changes, put it that way. It's always like a much deeper discussion around yeah. level of effort costs. What value do we get from it? Does it, if we do something on one lid, does that interfere with like a shared component on other products? And it's, everything's real matrixed and process, which is uh, kind of what makes it fascinating in a weird way, you know, but there is, it, it's always more complex, I think, even versus what I think. Oh, well, come on, just, it's a new sticker. It doesn't exist. Just let's print them, ship them, slap them on top. Well, no, because these labels already go on top. Do we move these? If we move these, what else does that impact? It's, right. it's interesting. <laughs> Dude, it's just so crazy how complex it is. We talk about making our uh, our companies work like a machine, but it's like your guys' manufacturing is just like a, like a bunch of machines that are having to work together to kick out, you know, this one thing. But I love, you know, talking about processes and all those different things because there's just so many it comes to logistics and marketing and the manufacturing and testing. There's just so many things that I'm sure get to a point where you have to make a decision and there's a process at that decision. Like everywhere you look, you know what to do when that happens. And I think that's good for us and for the listeners to, you know, really value, put a value on making processes for everything that happens in your business. But it seems like you must have that. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't just wing it every day with a, you know, manufacturing like you guys do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tough to operate on an ad hoc basis where everything's kind of a judgment call in the moment. You need to kind of develop teams and processes that help kind of automate the decision-making in places. So you just kind of know how you operate. I think um, that's why it's important to talk about it. Cause I think a lot of us really don't, we take advantage of like going able to a store and just buying something and not really understanding, or even especially in our industry, you go to distribution, you buy a pump and that that's all your transaction in your head mm -hmm. is. But like what gets that pump to that place is <laughs> there's so much, it's such a huge operation. There's so many different departments. Mm -hmm. Every product has a product manager. I mean, none, none of that we understood until we started doing a lot of this, like speaking with product managers that are specifically for that product, not, and not everybody can answer that question because they don't, hang out, hang out with that product. So it's like, you got to get to the right people or understand there's so many layers and so many levels of being a manufacturer that we just don't, 
understand when you just go up and buy a product even yeah you know and the last thing we're uh, sacrifice is quality i mean you you look at products and it, it takes years to get a product out and there's certain stages that they have to go through to get sign offs and checks that go through you know lab testing and they're looking at failure rates etc oh no that's not good we gotta get it to this point before we even push forward you know in field user testing and you know again back in our lab I and mean, it goes through so much testing like over 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 testing of what would actually occur in a, a real situation and we got uh, uh, climate chambers in which it can try to uh, mimic uh, a condition in miami versus a condition in uh you know northern california for an example and uh, you know, just the advancements in technology in general, where we're able to, uh, you know, expedite getting going to market and also understanding the quality uh, by ut utilizing the use of, you know, 3D printers and stuff, right? I mean, before that, you'd have to outsource that, wait for a while, wait till it comes back. And, you know, now you leave the office, you throw it in a 3D printer of a little part or a gizmo, and the next day it's ready to go right there, kind of a prototype. And, throw it on and test it. And uh, so it's, there, there's just a lot to that side of the business. And we have like, you know, greater than 20 uh, manufacturing facilities, uh, you know, part of the, the global Floridra. It's a big part of a big operation. Yeah. And I think we're so quick to complain about something or want something to change. And you just don't understand what in myself included, you know, I complain about stuff all the time. And it doesn't work right. Or something doesn't work. And you just don't understand what goes in to making that subtle change or like making it a whole different product. It's, it's just a lot. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm a lot more empathetic to that. Having worked on a military base and seeing a vehicle go from nothing, Yeah, you know, you see, you know, the beginning stages of Humvee or, uh, you know, a triple seven howitzer gun from nothing. And there's just millions of parts where it starts at the warehouse and it's just these little parts being brought through. And then there's a line built, and everything is very strategic and process driven. And it goes down this line until it goes out the door and it gets sold. Like there's so much to it. Um, for listeners, if you really want to know too, there's a lot of really cool documentaries out there. I think there's a lot of big companies that have seen that as a good investment in making these documentaries on how, you know, manufacturing, like how manufacturing works. Remember the show, how things mm -hmm. are made or mm -hmm. is that yeah, what it's I think it's how things are made, man, that is like incredible. <laughs> like, They'll just take anything that you wouldn't think like, oh, it probably is like some bonehead probably makes this and wherever you'd be. It is insane. Like, you know, even just uh, packaging. What was that? Oh, like one was like making candy bars. Like, I don't know what anybody thinks about that, but damn yeah. <laughs> the process in like, you know, making it and getting it wrapped. Yeah. I mean, without like people handling it, right. wrapping it, putting it in box, like the automation in this yeah. and. You know, places like Amazon, I mean, it was only a month ago I was tripping out. I was in Walmart and I saw one of the uh, the automated cleaners, the self-driving cleaners. I'd never seen that before. I was just like, I felt like I was in a Jetsons cartoon. I'm like, I'm like whoa, hey, somebody know this. Nope, so nobody's driving this. Yeah. Somebody's ghost riding the whip. <laughs> Get a hold of it. <laughs> um, you see like Domino's is rolling out those like vehicles that are delivering pizzas with nobody in it. Those those neuro vehicles right oh, too soon man i think it's those insane, things are gonna get dude. jacked <laughs> <laughs> I see the, the, the commercial trucks. like oh my word dude something rolls up and just opens up for you to get your pizza like <laughs> 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 pretty crazy <laughs> so for those that may not know kind of what is the distinction between a manufacturer a distributor and dealer and kind of how do they all work together yeah i mean i think uh you know in our industry it's kind of unique we have that multi-step distribution right i think a lot of times when i kind of explain it to others outside of the industry they're like wait a minute so you're the manufacturer and you sell it to one company who then sells it to another company who then sells it to a consumer yeah yeah that's right and in, the, in their mind they have like this apple vision of like you know it's apple right and it's just i walk into apple or a target and then i got a levi's but here it's like we have those multiple steps in there and each of those steps it makes each one of those entities, you know, very hyper specialized in what they do. And there's a place for it, right? You look at the manufacturers manufacturing all these different types of products. And, and then you look at the, from a distributor standpoint where they take the collection of products and there's a lot that goes into building that perfect backyard experience, right? And you need someone to aggregate that where that dealer can go there and expedite their purchase and have all that accessible to them. And then, you know, the, the dealers, the prescriber, they're understanding the consumer's needs. They're nurturing that account base and, you know, they're, they're installing and servicing that. And yeah, I think in my, um, 
my previous industry I was in, I was, I was so close to understanding where that product lived. Uh, I, every time a widget or anything got sold, I knew where that product was going to live. I knew the end, that end spot where it was going to, to live at. And I had that really intimate connection with, with the dealer and the end user too. And I think, uh, you know, one of the probably important things in this industry is that, you know, us as manufacturers, we can't lose sight of what occurs downstream, right? Uh, we don't have that clear visibility. We sell that product to a distributor. That distributor then sells that to the dealer. The distributor doesn't then see the visibility of where that product is at the consumer level. And I think uh, that, you know, from a, a, a manufacturer perspective, it, you know, we really need to stay close through every single of the stages downstream. So that way we can make better products. We can support our dealers more. We can understand their pain points and, and, and learn how to su uh, support better. And there's also different like levels of negotiations with different selling points. So you have to negotiate with distribution on a price point. They negotiate with the dealer. The dealer then prices it for a consumer. So there's so much of that like, okay, we have to discuss and figure out all of that. And how does it get to a point where that price point of the consumer is, is a good one? I mean, there's a lot in that piece too. Hmm. Yeah. And it's, uh, you, you know, that we, we ship it down to the distributor and then that product's kind of, you know, out of our hands. There's so much nuances that, that occur as a product uh, goes downstream. And, you know, I think it, it, it makes, uh, some additional complexities there, but you know, there's, there's definitely a need for, for each of the entities. It's a unique industry, right? I come from consumer electronics where it was, we had much more visibility to our end user and the consumer and their kind of usage behavior and here you do kind of through that two-step process from manufacturer to distributor, distributor to dealer, dealer to homeowner. You do lose a little bit of the connection there, but that's kind of why we talked a little bit about earlier, like all the different ways we, we listen to feedback. So whether it's monitoring social, which we see consumers much more active on, ratings and reviews, consumers much more active on, feedback that comes through through the call center, both pros as well as consumers, we get feedback through there. Those are key touch points for us to understand sort of what our product brand relationship is with the consumer directly. We get a lot of feedback from, from our, our pros, our dealers. To be doing our job right, whether it's just from kind of pure responsiveness or future product development or just general brand engagement, like at a base marketing level, like we need to be actively listening to all those points of feedback. Yeah, that's a good point with the consumer feedback because I think a lot of times as a dealer, when we're installing something, we just want it to be how we want it. And we don't really think about probably the homeowner, how they're gonna actually use it and is it convenient to use? You just have to think about that because if you think of statistics like 35% of pools are being serviced by pool professionals, but there's another 60%, 65% of people that are taking care of the pools themselves. And they have to be able to have a user-friendly product that you guys have to think about that mm -hmm. we don't. So there's so much even more on that end. It's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. I would think one of the more complicated things in being a manufacturer is every product, you have to understand that you're having to educate people on how to install this product think there's probably that difference between when you worked at Sony and now with Fluidra where Sony, most of the products, yeah, there could be a learning curve on this camera, these headphones, different things like that. But a lot of it is pretty, pretty turnkey ready, opposed to a new pump filter, salt system, a cleaner, whatever it may be. You're thinking about, we're going to make videos. Are we going to make, you know, different, you know, illustrations on how to install this? You know, what is everything going to look like and how are we actually going to get that out? to those people. Cause I think that's probably one of the most important things. If we, as a pool service company feel confident mm -hmm. in how to install this product, or there's a lot of automation now and how to program it and how to get a hold of the customer's phone and actually put this information on there, then I'm going to really want to be aggressive with how I sell this and how I brand it on my website. So taking all those things into consideration for every product, that's got to be a real yeah, it's, uh, mission. It's, I mean, you know, some, some products are going to lean more kind of towards the pro. So take a, a Jandy heater, you know, that's a lot of emphasis on efficiency, installation guides, that kind of things to help people program and set it up. 
um, tied into automation. From the consumer, it's much lighter. Your focus is on how this saves you money, how quickly it can heat a pool or a spa, why it's the best heater on the market, that type of thing. But, you know, when you talk about pool cleaners, then it kind of switches the other way. You, you, you do need information for the pro. You need to make sure they understand what this new cleaner is, how it works, why it's good, why they should recommend it to their consumers. But it's a lot more of a just in nature DIY type product, right? So then you kind of, your, your marketing shift is generally going to be B2C. But I would say with every product we launch, you know, when I'm sitting with my team, we are, we're developing pro-directed communications. The features you talk about and why it's good is totally different than what you're going to say to the consumer. And my days at Sony, unless we were talking about Sony uh, AV receivers, which if you've seen the back of one, there's about like 400 <laughs> different inputs and outputs and things. Um, but generally, you know, like a, you're saying, plug it in and hit power and right. you're good to go. You know, we're, we're not necessarily saying that anymore. Right. That's definitely the role of the manufacturers to, you know, obviously to provide the training as well. And I think, you know, as, as, a, as a dealer, they're they're installing this product. And I think that goes a lot into the products that we're making, you know, the JXI and a lot of other products are, you know, retrofit or aftermarket type products that, you know, we're understanding that, you know, these products need to be able to, you know, be kind of dropped in place and be able to fit tight areas. And, you know, we have a whole Floridra Pro Academy team that helps to empower our our dealers to to know what to expect when they go in that backyard so that way they can get in and out quicker and faster. Very good. We're going to take another quick break. When we get back, Brad and Donnie share their thoughts on why a manufacturer should be so much more to their dealers than just pumping out product, communicating to consumers during this time of high demand, and what role the manufacturers can play to keep the industry cool, healthy, and thriving. This episode of the Pool Chasers podcast is brought to you by CCH. CCH is your pool and spa chlorination solutions for backyards, hotels, apartments, condos, and athletic facilities. Their lineup of cyanuric-free disinfection solutions help bathers enjoy a sparkling, clean pool experience. No trichlor? No problem. Research shows it can take six times the amount of water to keep CYA in recommended ranges using trichlor as compared to water needed to keep CCH in recommended ranges with calcium hypochlorite. With an easy load cartridge to control dosing and a drain port to prevent spills, their new CCH endurance feeders is easy to install and service. Using a slow-dissolve calcium hypochlorite tablet, it offers a convenience of traditional trichlor feeder systems, but with the benefits of a non-stabilized CalHypo system. It's a CYA-free, no-drip, slow-dissolve, low-maintenance alternative for residential and commercial pool chlorination. To find out more, listen to episode 153 of the podcast, visit cchpoolcare.com or click the link below. This episode of Pool Chasers Podcast is also brought to you by Lion Financial. Partner with industry leader in swimming pool loans, Lion Financial, to make backyard dreams come true. Lion Financial has financing options for swimming pool and home improvement projects of $5,000 and above, including pool equipment. Their programs offer your customers the very best in pool financing solutions, including rates as low as 2.99%, terms up to 25 years, unsecured loans up to 150000 and options available for credit scores of 620 and above. Lion Financial is proudly veteran-owned and operated. In gratitude for active or retired military members, Lion Financial is offering a new promotion in 2021 with rates as low as 5.75% for 20 years or rates as low as 5.99% for 15 years, both on approved credit. This program offers completely free financing as a show of appreciation for those who have served our country. Speaking of free, it's absolutely free for pool contractors to partner with Lion Financial. Financing options make it easier for your customers to say yes to a pool. Lion Financial never charges prepayment penalties or consulting fees to your clients and partners with both you and your customers until the project is complete. Lion Financial pays pool professionals directly, ensuring you are paid on time and in full with flexible draw schedules available upon request. When it comes to something as important as a pool, work with true professionals who have the best interests of both you and your customers in mind. With more than 42 years of experience specializing in pool financing solutions, why trust anyone but the experts? Call Lion Financial today or click the link below for more information. Yeah, so I mean, we've had a lot of conversations about how you guys are very focused on forming partnership with your dealers, not just kind of selling the products. So can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, sure. I think the traditional idea of the manufacturer is 
we build products, we put them in a box, we ship box from point A to point B, and then transaction done, we move on to the next product. That's certainly not how we approach it. Like, I think there's this deep core belief at Fluidra that manufacturer's role is much bigger than that. You know, it's about kind of uh, ongoing partnership. It's about, you know, based on the idea that if we don't do all we can to make dealers successful, that's not a long-term success strategy for us. So we need to kind of, you know, I'd say our thinking kind of always centers on, you know, three kind of themes, right? First of all, listen. Don't just get in your kind of like tunnel vision mode of build products and run, build products and run and just kind of scatter shot them out there. So listen to what's actually needed and build that into kind of what you build and kind of how you support it. Number two, it's uh, really be easy to do business with. And, and all these are kind of relate to each other. So, you know, launch a product, have the right tools to help dealers sell it, have the right customer support in place, have the right training pieces in place. Um, do everything you can to kind of make yourself easy to do business with. If our call times are too long, don't just kind of throw your hands in there and say, that's the way it is. It's season. It's busy. No, figure out what we need to do, who we need to bring in, what technologies we need to employ to make sure we kind of reduce those call times. So, so resolve pain points. And then I think the third, which to me is kind of one of the more critical ones, is don't just stop at the level of solid support. Figure out how you can proactively go out there and help dealers drive their growth. So, you know, there's things like the Jandy policy we've touched on that, you know, that will support the dealer in terms of kind of helping even the playing field between brick and mortar and e-commerce. But I mean, there's more to it. I think, you know, in our industry, manufacturers have a bigger role to play in terms of lead generation, for example. We know that one of the pain points for our customers is they're in the field all day, building pools, servicing pools, replacing equipment. It's hard work. You're exhausted at the end of the day. Where do they have time to kind of market their own company to consumers out there? How do they go prospect new customers? Um, think of their company, not as a company, but as a brand with uh, visibility in their kind of local community and marketplace. So what opportunities are there for us to kind of provide marketing services that you know, at least can give them something as simple as a brochure or consult on a website or connect them with people who can actually build out websites and run SEO campaigns and, you know, dip their toes in PPC or, or tools that help them promote themselves over social. So there's this just kind of much bigger aspect that to me, when I think about if I'm a dealer and I'm trying to figure out who I partner with, you know, I'd want to look at who's got the bigger vision of the industry and, and who's got um, more levers that I can pull to help drive my business. Product's one thing. We got to have the right, right product in the right place at the right time because we do operate on this kind of just-in-time basis. I need a pool pump today. I need to go buy one at the distributor and then go replace it. But, um, you know, I think it's on manufacturers and not just fluid, but I think much larger. Like, you know, how do we kind of create this sort of, you know, ecosystem between dealer, manufacturer, where we're kind of, you know, we're supporting their success, helping them grow in terms, and in turn, they're kind of building their companies and buying more product and helping promote our success. Like, that's the bigger brand question when I think of Fluider. Like, what does Fluider stand for? It's, it's this bigger sense of partnership. And, you know, you mentioned it earlier, too, when you mentioned kind of you've had good feedback for, for our sales team. Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of ways, they are our brand ambassadors. If they take a moment to help someone out, if they take a moment to understand where the needs are in their business, and then they, you know, talk with someone like Donnie or I to connect them with a marketing service or, um, you know, have us come in and, you know, look at their website, make some suggestions, um, or even just sometimes people just need help getting a marketing plan recommended to them. You know, hey, don't focus on this. Don't do direct mail. Let's focus on, uh, you know, rehabbing your social or something like that. It, it can go a long ways and just kind of helping people sort of grow and turn their business on in maybe ways it hasn't been previously. So, yeah, and it's crazy how responsible manufacturer is for kind of the identity of all pool companies. Because if you can't make products that can't, I can't build a pool that is going to do certain things if I don't have the equipment that can make that happen. All these ideas I can have. Yeah, I can put it in a CAD. I can make a 3D rendering of it. 
Um, I can make uh, whatever out of it, but it will stop there if I can't have equipment that can make this possible. So, you know, as manufacturers, guys are pretty much responsible of all of the capabilities from service to to pool builders. I mean, and uh, I'd say we're kind of raising our hands to say we're willing to be more accountable too, right? We're willing to, and this stuff isn't easy, right? But, you know, I believe we need to kind of take a hard look at what we do to drive leads down to a local level or down to the dealer level. Like, what are we doing to deliver trackable leads, right? So people can grow their company, have people to call. Right now, I think everyone's flooded with leads. So the topic is like, can we, you know, let's focus on just product <laughs> yeah. supply at the moment, but this won't last forever, right? So, you know, at some point later this year, next year, lead flow will slow down, right? And so as people want to kind of continue the growth trajectory, a lot of our pros have enjoyed the past year. I'd say that's where manufacturers certainly have a role to step in and, and start providing solutions to deliver qualified leads to help them grow. Mm -hmm. That's that's awesome. And I think it's probably more about uh, the quality of the leads right now, because you might be getting flooded with leads, yeah. but if they're not quality leads that you can do something with or make a profit from, then it's actually just more work on your business yeah. where you're just trying to weed through all these. And remember being there where the phone was blowing up, the emails, everything, more than half of them were not, a, you yeah. know, they were like bargain shoppers and they were calling everybody and emailing everybody. And had to figure out a way of, you know, narrowing that down so that when we went to visit a pool that we weren't wasting our time, more than likely we were going to get this. And they were, they have an understanding of what our monthly rate is given the details they gave us of the pool. Yeah. Um, so if you have a lot of people going to your site right now, one thing I heard recently that I thought was so cool was this builder turned down a client and building their home because they weren't a right fit for different reasons, but they did it responsibly. And they said, we'll put you on our newsletter because we're always giving tips and we have this blog and da, 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 da. What had happened was they actually referred the right customer to that company and then they came back. And I just thought like, that's it's pretty basic, right? Fundamental stuff, but that's good in these times where if you have, it's not easy, but say you can put out a blog once a week or once a month, and that might not be the right person, but you want to get that constant traffic on your website so that you keep relevant with the times because you're right. Like things aren't always going to be as hot as they are now. It's going to, it's going to die down, but you know, you want to make sure that when things do slow down that, you know, those leads keep coming in. Yeah. It's never, uh, it's never simple too. Cause I know a lot of our, our customers have, uh, you know, they've been getting so many calls and there's just a bunch of tire kickers out there. There's that certain level of like, man, I just need to focus on servicing the customers I have in process now. I can't be on the phone for two hours a day. But then you start seeing some of those folks that don't get a call back starting to leave negative reviews, uh, whether it's on Yelp or, you know, Google review, just based on the fact that they haven't got a phone call. So it, it can be difficult to manage in, I think, to your point, communications key. You know, I, I know that, uh, in the landscape industry, I've seen a lot of folks start to put information, you know, very prominently on homepages where they talk about just simple stuff like given the demand right now, you know, we're, we're only considering projects in this price range and that, you know, please note we're currently on a six month backlog. Please note due to material availability, we're no longer utilizing these types of pavers or, you know, just kind of simple Super stuff smart. so that when people are searching and finding them, there's some sort of expectation up front that they're not just going to call for a $3,500 job and have it complete in the next two weeks. It's just, you know, like our industry, that's just not on the mm -hmm. table right now. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a great idea and being proactive because that's a good way to not get a negative review, right? You know, it's like, hey, we stated pretty clearly on our Yelp page, Google page mm -hmm. or the website that we're six months out. We don't do this type of work, taking jobs on there between this price and this price. You know, sorry if you didn't see that. And even if you still get a negative review, we know from experience that a lot of people read those negative yeah, reviews. Yeah. And more importantly, they, they read the responses. Mm -hmm. So if we respond with something like that, it's, I mean, we've had tons of people tell us like, yeah, we've 
seen what they wrote and we just thought like right. what a bonehead yeah. you know review <laughs> yeah. we love you know how you handled it because a lot of times um it is about the way you handle a situation exactly you yeah. know what i mean and we have to th think about right now i mean none of us probably need a lot of leads right now but it's 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 gonna you know come down from these peak levels at some point and we have to look at the opportunity that that there is right it's how we treat our customers today is you know that that could be your customer tomorrow and uh, from a manufacturing standpoint there's there's levers we've we've dialed back on right and you know those leads we're driving are very specific they're they're usually they're ready on a particular type of a product that they're saying hey i want to buy this thing and then we want to pass them on to our loyal dealers but you know we got some levers we can pull in the future but uh, it's really how are we capturing these customers, and I think that's someone that's something we should all do. I love the recommendation that 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 pool builder was doing: capture them, put them on a blog, put them on a newsletter, engage them in the future because they could be your customer tomorrow. Yeah, and before I forget, I want to ask one question because I keep forgetting to ask this: How tight is your manufacturing to say Australia or going on in another country? Do you guys work together at all? How do, how does that work? varies by kind of product category to what extent we work with you know our global counterparts so strategically very tight in there's meetings whether it's on the product side operation side finance side even hr side as well as marketing side where we kind of talk about regional pri re by region i mean like country priorities and where we partner where we don't i'd say generally markets even regulatory environments are very different in europe and then you, we think of Europe as Europe, but in reality, you got to remember there's Germany, UK, France, Spain, Portugal, Hungary, you know, I mean, it just, it gets further broken down in terms of like market dynamics. Same thing with, you know, Australia, South Africa, um, New Zealand, other larger mid, mid major kind of markets. So that's um, crazy. That's just a whole other level of complexity yeah, yeah. to the so, whole so, manufacturing process. So generally it, it's, uh, there's coordination some places where there's alignment on kind of product development um though i'd say the general rule is it gets quite differentiated and each region really kind of drives the business as they need to based on kind of the total dynamics of of their market right well it's a good thing you guys are in california because there's so many regulations that they <laughs> <laughs> used to <laughs> so yeah, yeah if it's good everywhere california else should be good <laughs> everywhere else is easy yeah <laughs> I want to make one more point in the lead generation thing, though. I think lots of people probably don't need leads, but if you're coming in as a brand new company and you don't have an established website or established Yelp or Google, you're probably not being found, mm -hmm. you know? And so like from, and they're also probably looking for a manufacturer to tie themselves to. So I think if, as a manufacturer, if you set yourself up to produce leads for those people, if they become a dealer and there are certain people that do need leads, there are younger businesses, smaller businesses that probably are still hungry for those that I think if you as a manufacturer, if you prove like, oh, we're still there for you, like here's leads and or here's how we're trying to help you. Because yeah. I'm sure there still are, a lot of us probably oversee that because it's like, well, everybody we hear, everybody mm -hmm. we talk to doesn't need any more leads, but those are already really established companies. And mm -hmm. these younger people that are coming in these new businesses, like they're still looking for all that. So yeah, yeah it's uh, for us, you know, it's just, you, you, you challenge yourself to take a end to end life cycle view of what we can do to support the customer. So leads are a part of that kind of, growth engine we could help provide but then there's also stuff like uh software right so yeah. software services for a service company versus software services for a builder they're two different business types and they got completely different characteristics in terms of how they run a business versus a you know service route ongoing evergreen kind of business model um so it's even just kind of we take it upon ourselves to figure out ways we can kind of help provide value adds that make you more efficient. You're trying to drive the business on one side, make them more efficient on the other. Um, as we launch new products, make sure the right training programs in place, giving them sales tools to kind of, so they can sell to their consumers when they come in their showroom or when they go take their visits to kind of scope out potential works and repairs and make recommendations on products and fixes. So it's, uh, there's just kind of this 360 degree picture that I, one thing I just, you know, appreciate about Fluider is we, we assume that's all fair game and that we got to kind of chase it and figure it out. So are we always right and perfect? Of course not. Do we keep trying? Hell yes. You know, right. we keep, yeah. it's like you, you know, you chip away, chip away, chip away, and you eventually start 
you know, the, the statue in the granite starts emerging and I think that's a differentiation with our, our sales reps, you know, they're they're not coming in and selling product and prices They they truly want to understand, you know, your business. What, what do you do day in and day out? And how can we support that? How, how can we support your growth? How can we support how more efficient you are? And you are, our sales leader says that all the time, understand their business and be a true business partner, right? Mm -hmm. If you can help them grow or you know, leads, we talked about one element, but just make them more efficient and with software and other elements that is way more beneficial than a $10 off of a pump or whatever it might be, right? The $10 off a pump's great too, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, how, how can we, you know, partner with them and, and that should be our number one conversion tool really, right? You know, the way in which we support our dealer's ability to compete at that local level and also against kind of the internet, right? Uh, the way in which we support our dealers should be the number one reason why we get uh, new dealers. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think to, from a sales rep perspective, like to listen to what the company does and be that person for them and fill those gaps or fill those pain points. Cause our Fluidra or Jandy at the time rep, we are very clear with him what we are not probably buying from him at that point, but we are open to these few things and few lines like, Hey, you know, we love the JXI heaters. So like anything that the JXI is like, please tell us, we've talked to us. We love these things about Fluidra and Jandy. And this is what we're looking for to work with you. And there's very, you know, compliant to that. And I never pushed other things on. And then every once in a while we listen to what he had to say, like, Oh, we got this new thing. Why don't you try it out? All right, we'll try it out. And so you kind of develop that relationship where it's like, we, we're really looking for these things. Like, can you provide that? Yes. And he did. And it was, it was cool because he never really pushed a lot of things on us where it was like, yeah, he, this thing came out. If you want to check it out, we got to try me thing. And we did that a couple of times, you know, where, cause we wanted to keep that relationship cool. going. So it's pretty cool. That's the best way from an owner's perspective and a sales rep, like to have that relationship work yeah. really cool. cause they just really want, in my opinion, we just really wanted to have people listen to what we're saying and try to help those areas, right? Not just, yeah, we got this cool thing and you know, this, this light does this and that. I don't, I don't need any lights right now or I don't need yeah, this right now. It's yeah, like yeah. Well, it's pushing that same yeah. thing on me. You no, know? no, show up and throw up, you know, listen. Yeah, exactly. Don't approach. show up and throw up. Exactly, That's right, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really cool awesome. story. Cool yeah. story. So Brad, you've shared with me previously that like part of the manufacturing job is to kind of keep the industry healthy by showing how cool it is and how more advanced it's becoming like to consumers. So how are you guys doing that? And what kind of benefit does that have to the full professionals? You know, I think this is kind of like the, the question of the year. When, when I look at like our industry, right. And, uh, okay. So there's like things like the Jandy move to quit the internet. That's kind of a functional way we can kind of create a healthy industry and make sure service sector retailers can kind of grow and have an even playing field. That's kind of, to me, like that's the table sticks. I think, you know, for me, I like to think bigger picture here. And, and to me, you know, I, I think a good example is uh, a thermostat is not exciting. It's a thing on your wall with a little stick kind of interface. That's difficult to tell what the hell you're trying to set the temperature at, or there's a couple buttons. And then a company like Nest comes along and they, do some smart product design, they enable it with an app, all of a sudden, it's an enjoyable experience to check the temp of your house and program when things go on and off. And you know, when you're remote, just make sure your pets are cool and comfortable, <laughs> or whatever, like mm -hmm. people create the kind of fun aspects of that experience, just based on the, you know, technology and the experience Nest provided there. So for me, I sit back and, and like as a manufacturer, I'm looking at what our end experience is, which is like the crown jewel of a backyard. It's fun to play in. It's beautiful to look at. I mean, there's value just in the sense of an aquarium, having a beautiful pool in your backyard and it brings people together. I mean, like those are like three awesome things. So, so that's what we have to work with as an industry. And this is like all manufacturers. This is like everybody in service, everybody that builds pools, like that's our opportunities is to turn that pool. I mean, there's so much more potential there than there ever was in a thermostat yet. Look how fun the thermostat is. Thanks to mm -hmm. nest. So as a manufacturer, you know, I'm thinking like the possibilities are endless. Like what can we do to make this kind of ownership more fun and enjoyable for the homeowner? What, what can we do to kind of make it easier to install for the pro? What can we just kind of do to 
wrap this thing up in a unified, simple experience. So all focus is on the aesthetics, the enjoyment you get from a pool. And I think kind of as we move in that direction, you know, which involves like a updated connected ecosystem kind of revamps to the apps used to run it. I think you kind of inherently make our industry a more attractive place. Not only easy for us to create demand with consumers to actually put a pool or rehab an old pool in their backyard, but uh, also I think kind of on a more important level so that kids getting out of college and getting out of high school see this as not like some old, you know, we keep using the word manufacturer. And to me, that inherently goes back to like, the days of, you know, like Ford and GE and GM and this kind of stuff, like widgets shipped from here to there. But I'm thinking like it should be like the mentality where people in Silicon Valley think about the products and services they Mm -hmm. sell. Like we need to be more of kind of a, that service mentality, that experience mentality where people come in and they see, they focus on the pool and this crazy experience that we build around it through kind of a apps and controls and I don't know, all the things we haven't thought of yet. So to me, you do that, you kind of not only create demand for the experience we sell, I think you kind of create a more attractive industry for new blood coming in. And and that that could be kind of a career tracks that come in through, you know, a company like Fluidra, and they're more on the marketing, the finance, the operation side of things, or it could be like people that Instead of being a general contractor to build more housing or electrical contractor, you know, they're looking more specifically like, I want to start a business that works on pools because those pools are so freaking gorgeous and beautiful. You know, I, I want to be a part of that. So to me, that's kind of like, that's the vision. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's what I, I think we kind of want to aspire to whether we get there. Well, I don't know, but <laughs> like, you know, I know we got a cool roadmap, product roadmap mm-hmm. ahead of us. I, I know the go. potential's there. I think it's just kind of getting that vision centered and, you know, the mind share and the drive. And I, I just think it would be like a very exciting industry from the outside looking in if we can kind of take that analogy of the thermostat mm-hmm. and, and do that with the pool. Because yeah. whatever is cool about the thermostat, it's like going to be a billion times better once we do that with a <laughs> pool. Right. Yeah, it's cool to hear from a manufacturer's standpoint. You know, Greg, Greg's been talking about that for years about the experience and how cool a pool is and how people don't look at it the right way, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I, I, I couldn't be more excited about what you said because I think if it comes from the manufacturer and it's done correctly, then we will finally be seen as an industry that people want to be a part of their going to be psyched to get out of high school and be an engineer and maybe be a part of this, or they want to make lifestyle items for the pool industry. And it's like, when you think about a swimming pool, like be present in a great moment and think about why you love being there. What song is playing? What conversations are being talked about? Some of the most uh, crazy conversations in my life have been by a pool, seriously, with my brother Tyler here in high school after a football game or it was moving in or, you know, talking to your, you know, first love of your life or whatever it may be. There's so many situations. Was there fire going? Like, what is it about that situation that just made it so perfect? Your kids are laughing and playing and doing all these things. The smell of the barbecue, the trees and the, you know, vines all over the wall. Whatever it is, it's just keeping that in your brain, that real moment that you didn't, you didn't go out of your way to make, um, like say like a marketing photo shoot, but you can turn real moments into how you kind of brand your company because it's a, it's a beautiful place. We've all been in the backyard setting or the, by the swimming pool. And it's just like, everything is clicking. You know, that 4th of July party, the Mm -hmm. smell, the smoke, every little thing is just perfect where you just like, man, yeah, just want to be here all day. Love it. I think, I think there's uh, you know, I'm a data person. I love data. And just, I think the nest is a a great example and it's a, it's a lifestyle. Look at all these other lifestyle uh, brands that are out there and how much uh, people are willing to almost kind of spend for that. I mean, just looking at a car, a Tesla, just all the data and technology that's within that. And then we have all these pieces of equipment and, 
what type of data is coming from that, right? And how, how can we create a better experience with the data that we're obtaining from these pieces? Of, how can we make our you know, servicing pools, building pools better with, with that type of data? So I, I just look at it, the workforce, right? We need more people. We need more focus, and especially right now, right? We need more people in this industry right now. We've needed it for the past five years, but I really, really see a, a different approach to it, expansion of marketing, expansion of data, expansion of connected devices, just an expansion of the way in which we go to market and really fuel it with some new blood. Yeah, and I mean, it's back to responsibility. It's really, you have the budget and you're manufacturing these items. So first and foremost, like on a global scale, you're the one putting these things out to the world and letting them know, hey, you love the nest for your home. Well, we got something that is just as intuitive and all these different things that you can use for your pool and you can control it from inside, outside. You're at dinner and you want to set the spa to this, whatever. Like most companies that aren't manufacturers don't have that budget or understanding because we don't have the data that you have in terms of demographics of Who's actually going to watch this because they see that somewhere, somehow Leslie's or on a video ad or billboard, who knows, but they're going to come to the pool service company maybe and say like, Hey, I saw this. Can you do this? Cause that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. So there's another thing to be responsible for. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, uh, challenge accepted. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> i think service companies too could do a much better job at promoting it like we've always talked about of going after those customers and understanding what's in your backyard and if those people need auto- automation upgrades like explaining it to auto- you know those automation upgrades to them and being able to use it through you know alexa or those type of things that in the future like there's just so much you can do that they probably don't even understand or see so we we try to do that with brothers like explain the people we knew that didn't have automation like we would probably run, you know, some type of program towards those people and then have those conversations on the phone and explain to them. I mean, you're going to probably be younger generation people that want all that, but you got to be able to communicate that as well from our side. So it's kind of a, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a full chain. You know, I, you know, we, we have the manufacturer, we have our role to play. And I think we also kind of have a support role to play to make sure it can going to be pulled through by Mm-hmm. builders yep. and by service companies. So well, yeah, I mean, cause you it's, got it's people, working. you're going to put all that technology out there, but then it's, am I, can I install it? Right. That's, that's the gap that that's there yeah. big time is I'm kind of afraid of that. Mm-hmm. And you got to bring down that wall of, I'm not afraid anymore. I can do it. You have the support to kind yeah. of install those type of things, you know? And to your point too, it's that, you know, from our standpoint, we want to make sure that there's grab and go capabilities that, you know, we could provide to a service so that they could just deploy really quickly to create demand for automation and, yeah. and, and other things as well. And, you know, that's what we really try to focus on, especially trying to be a partner with, uh, with, with our uh, customer base. Very cool. So we're going to record a separate episode on the state of the industry with your team, but we wanted to touch briefly on the increased demand of the pandemic and specifically when it comes to your relationship with dealers, you know, what, are you doing to keep up, you know, with communication with them at this time? Yeah. So in a couple of weeks, you'll talk with Scott Frost, our senior vice president of sales, um, been in the industry for a long time, seen all kinds of ups and downs. I'm very familiar with the industry. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. Donnie mentioned the the example of the bike part he can't get. I know my F-150 taillight is cracked and I've been waiting now eight weeks for a replacement taillight to be shipped. So we're all dealing with this kind of insane period where the laws of supply and demand have gone sideways um, and one is outpacing the other. Um, Our industry is no different. And beyond, uh, of course, we put a lot of focus uh, on working with global counterparts, trying to increase our operational footprint, increase increase the size of our supply chain, um, ramp up manufacturing so we can do more to kind of meet demand. That as much should be obvious. And I think all things considered, we've done a reasonable job getting there. But really the focus has been, let's recognize the situation for what it is. There are some supply constraints and on the, our dealers are caught in between manufacturers and distributors on one side, And then on the other side, pool owners and people who want a new pool, their expectation is not that they need to wait several weeks, you know, to have a pump installed or, or anything like that. So really I think it's critical that, 
you know, we kind of be as communicative as, as possible. So the, you know, I won't get into details, but we've, we've ramped up communication. We're, we've done, uh, taken great efforts to be transparent. So distributors kind of have a sense of what our lead times look like and where we're seeing constraints. We've also armed our field team since they're kind of that primary point of contact with a lot of our pool pros out there so that they know where there's pockets of availability, perhaps opening up where there's constraints and they can help steer people in the right direction as, you know, builders and servicers are thinking like three, four, five weeks down the road, like what's you know, the pump supply situation going to be. So Scott's going to get in more detail around this, but we, we've really tried to kind of make sure that we're transparent. We acknowledge, acknowledge the situation for what it is. We don't try to deny anything and just let people know kind of how best to navigate this through giving them more information about where we stand with our supply. Yeah. I think that's really what everybody wants from a dealer standpoint is just to have that communication not be left in the dark. So from a manufacturer standpoint, I think that's your role in that, like just making sure and being as transparent as you can to those people. So yeah, we'll definitely dive into that a lot deeper. Yeah. It'll be a, him, so it'll be a fun conversation. And I, I think you're having it with the right person. Cause like I said, he's been around in the industry a long time and he's just seen well, what happened in the housing crash of 2005 and what happened in, you know, the recession of 2008, what the bounce back look like, you know, how did market dynamics shift? So there's a lot of probably interesting, just kind of historical perspective to shed light on kind of where we're at today and why sure. we prioritize what we prioritize as a company. Cool. So for now, you got to buy lights for your F-150, buy two. <laughs> <laughs> just in case you uh that's funny break the new one with your surfboard you got a backup you should i buy one left and one right <laughs> or double up on oh, right two left two rights man you never know i mean you got an f-150 in san diego i'm sure you didn't get that because it's so good in you know traffic no, and no. all those tight roads <laughs> yeah, yeah no not much snow snow out there right so is there anything you can share that's coming down the pipeline that's kind of cool and exciting mm -hmm. I think it's just, uh, you know, cl closer relationship with our dealers, understanding what it is that they're, you know, they do in their day to day. You know, a lot of the conversation that we had today about how a, a manufacturer can be a good partner. Um, that's where we're really focusing on. As I said before, we want to make sure that our number one conversion tool is the way in which we support our dealers uh, through transparency, uh, through supporting them and through having a, a very uh, high quality uh, sales team. Any cool products? Can share. We got a lot of really cool. Products yeah, a lot coming. of cool products. We just really can't cool tell products. you about them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Too many to discuss. <laughs> cool. Well, you know what? We'll all be back at trade shows um, soon, so uh, you'll start getting some glimpses. And we'll we'll actually be uh, at the uh, international show in November for mm -hmm. the first time in a while. So nice. There may be some sneak peeks there. Cool. There Looking go. forward to it. So where can people reach out and find information or become one of your dealers? FluidraUSA.com is the best place to kind of get started. I'd also probably drop in uh, if any of your dealers are interested in one of our loyalty programs. We probably have one of the most lucrative aftermarket programs in the industry, uh, FluidraRewards.com. Uh, go under sign up and I will get you into contact with your local rep. Or if you know your local rep, you know, reach out to them. Thanks for coming out, guys. We really appreciate hey, it. Good to a, see you guys again. Awesome. Appreciate the time. We've had yeah. a good time. So it's great. Talk to you soon. All right. Hey, pool chasers. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. To connect with today's guests, including pictures, links, and resources from everything discussed today, you can visit the episode page at poolchasers.com or click the links below. To connect more with us, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter by searching at pool chasers. If you would like to support the podcast, the easiest and most effective way is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as share the show or your favorite episode with a friend or on social media. Also, you can get early access to each episode by supporting us through Patreon. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for sharing some of yours with us today. See you out there, pool chasers.